So we're going to dive into three chapters today. And so hold on to your seatbelts, okay? And so we finished chapter two last week. And so we're going to be in Daniel chapter three this week. And so if you have your Bible, if you have something turned there, we're going to, just like the last two times, we're going to be going through different passages and we're going to tie in the narrative of scripture as a whole and look at some of those passages that help us better understand the current context of the passage that we're diving into today. And so this chapter is linked to the dream in chapter 2. Remember where King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream of this statue and there's the gold head and there's the silver chest and all the things. It goes all the way down to these four different kingdoms. Well, we're going to see right away in Daniel chapter 3 how this gold statue, this head of gold, plays out into Nebuchadnezzar. So let's read the first seven verses of chapter 3 and then we'll unpack it. It says, King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of what? Gold, whose height was 60 cubits and its breadth six cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then King Nebuchadnezzar sent to gather the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces gathered for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And the herald proclaimed aloud, You are commanded, O peoples of nations and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, as soon as all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, all the peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Okay? So, as we look at this, the very first thing this head of gold decides to do is to set up an image that is gold. And this wasn't just a small idol. It wasn't a small image. This idol was, according to the measurements here, scholars say it was about 90 feet high and 9 feet wide. So that's a pretty big statue, a pretty big idol that King Nebuchadnezzar has erected and has set up. And then he orders everything, all people, to sit down and to bow down when this music plays. And if we look at the beginning couple chapters of Daniel, remember God is orchestrating everything. God is behind the scenes. He's setting up everything. He set up King Nebuchadnezzar. He's going to set up these other kingdoms. God is in control of everything. But here you see in Daniel chapter 3, the author is showing us something else. He is showing us that instead of God being the one setting up and ordering, what is King Nebuchadnezzar doing? This is the image that what? He has set up. How many times did you read that in those seven verses? It says, this is the image that King Nebuchadnezzar set up. When you hear this, fall down and worship the image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And so what is the author wanting us to see? He wants us to see that this is the pride of man. This is what imperial powerful kingdoms do. They set up their own rules. They set up their own kingdoms. They think that they are in control, that this world operates on their power, their strength, their majesty, their great wisdom. And this is what every kingdom of man does, is we try to organize our own life in the ways that we see is right. And so King Nebuchadnezzar sets up this image because he wants to show his strength. He wants to show he's the most powerful person alive. And he chooses the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. This phrase is similar back into the earlier chapters where it refers to Genesis 11, where the Tower of Babel was erected. So again, just like Genesis 11, the Tower of Babel is all about the pride of man, where man is trying to make a name for himself. Again, this is what King Nebuchadnezzar does, sets up this golden statue in the same area 
where Genesis 11, mankind tried to show that they were in charge, they were going to bring heaven down to earth. And so again, we see this is a clash of God's kingdom versus the clash of the kingdoms of man. When we get to the image, we're not told what the image was. Wouldn't you like to know what the image was like? Part of me was like, man, I would love to know what it was. Was it, was, it, was it him? Was it an animal? Well, there are some things that can help us know what it probably wasn't, okay? Some people will say, some scholars say, well, it's probably an image of himself because he wants to show the people that he's the most powerful person, so it's probably of him. But when you look at the ancient Near East, when you look at the Babylonians and how they viewed their gods, most of the people will say this image was an image of a god because it was rare that a Babylonian king would ever depict an image of himself as an idol. It was always something of a god. They would make an image in the, the image of God, and man would never, these Babylonian kings would never make an image that represented themselves as something to be worshipped. So the idea is it's probably some kind of Babylonian god, maybe some kind of creature, and it's not Nebuchadnezzar himself because that goes against what that culture typically did. We're never really told because at the end of the day, does it really matter for this point of the story? No, cool detail would be great to know. And one day in heaven, we can probably find out and say, okay, God, what was that image? Probably won't even want to know then, but it doesn't matter to what the author wants us to see. So we see in here in these seven verses that once he erects his statue, he calls the satraps, the prefix, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials. Who are all these people? All these different names, they are the most powerful, important people in the kingdom. Okay, And it mentions twice he brings all of these. Why? Because he is telling all of these important people that have power in his kingdom, look at who I am, look at my power, and I am commanding you to do this. You have some power, but my power is greater than yours. And he wants to lord it over the people of his kingdom. So he calls all the important people and says, look, you're going to do what I tell you to do because I am in charge. And he wants his rulers to see this. And he wants the people that are underneath him, that are subjugated to him, he wants them to see. And he commands them, once you hear the music from all these different instruments, you're going to bow down and you're going to worship my idol. And four times it mentions these musical instruments. Four different times within this chapter. And why so many times is that important? Because this is what imperial, this, the musicians and the parade and the whole shebang that he's doing, it is to show his pomp and his pride. He wants to make a huge display to everybody out there. So take pride times 100. This whole chapter is all about Nebuchadnezzar. His pride is on such great display. He is not hiding it. He is not trying to downplay it. There is no humility with King Nebuchadnezzar because what he's experiencing in his kingdom is everything that he's done in his own might and in his own power. So he thinks. And so he calls all these musicians together so that he could put his pride on display. And then he tells all the people, once you hear it, bow down. Now, what do you think the majority of the people did? They bowed down. And why would they easily bow down if all of a sudden he introduces an image of a God? Why do they easily bow down? Yeah, they're used to bowing down to gods. They grew up in a polytheistic society, meaning they believed in many gods. And so if somebody comes and erects a new god and says, hey, this is the god of the couch, then hey, okay, I'll bow down to the god of the couch because we don't want to offend the god of the couch. And so all the people, they say, hey, let's, let's appease this God, let's sacrifice to it, let's worship it, because God forbid we don't do it, and then he holds the rain back, he causes a famine, or he brings a country to invade us, so we're going to worship. We're going to make sure these gods are appeased. And what this chapter really wants us to see is, it wants us to bring out this important truth. What does this decree mean to the faithful Jew, the people of God, who worship the one true God? Living in Babylon, hearing this decree, what is the response a faithful Jew should have? Right, no bowing. And so everybody else is bowing down to the statue. But the real question is, is for us as the reader is, when it comes to us in our own Babylonian culture that we have here, when the pressures of society come, are we going to bow the knee to appease 
man, or are we going to remain faithful to the truths that God has told us in his word? And so how does the faithful people of God respond when they're faced with idolatry, when they're faced with persecution, and when they're faced with death? Is it given in compromise, or what is it? Turn to Exodus chapter 20, and we're going to look at verses 3 through 6, because this is the background of these three friends that are going to go through a fiery trial in just a moment. And they understood what scripture said. They understood what God said. So even when the most powerful human on the planet gives a decree, they remember these words that God spoke in Exodus 20, verse 3 through 6. It says, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. So this is the background of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who said, we're not bowing. Because God said, no other gods. He's a jealous God. And if we obey him, man, the steadfast love of God is ever before me. But not only that, but they were also told by God through scripture, turn to Isaiah chapter 44. Because they have this scripture in mind as well. Because Israel, one of the things that Israel kept falling into was idolatry. You read the Old Testament and you see a nation comes in. They intermarry with that nation, they follow their gods, they fall into sin, and God has to come and judge them. God redeems them, they come out, they do what's evil in the sight of of God, and they fall into idolatry over and over and over again. And so God has to make a point to them and remind them of these things. Look at verse 12 in Isaiah 44, and we'll read. The ironsmith takes a cutting tool and works it over the coals. He fashions it with hammers and works it with his strong arm. He becomes hungry and his strength fails. He drinks no water and is faint. The carpenter stretches a line. He marks it out with a pencil. He shapes it with planes and marks it with a compass. He shapes it into the figure of a man with the beauty of a man to dwell in a house. He cuts down cedars or he chooses a cypress tree or an oak and lets it grow strong among the trees of the forest. He plants a cedar and the rain nourishes it. Then he becomes fuel for a man. He takes a part of it and warms himself. He kindles a fire and breaks bread. Also, he makes a god and worships it. He makes it into an idol and falls down before it. Half of it he burns in the fire. Other the half he eats meat. He roasts it and is satisfied. Also, he warms himself and says, Aha, I am warm. I have seen the fire. And the rest of it he makes into a god, his idol, and falls down to it and worships it. He prays to it and says, Deliver me, for you are my god. They know not, nor do they discern, for he has shut their eyes so that they cannot see, and their hearts so that they cannot understand. No one considers, nor is there knowledge or discernment to say, half of it I burn in the fire, I also bake bread on its coals, I roast and meat and have eaten, and shall I make the rest of it an abomination? Shall I fall down before a block of wood? He feeds on ashes, a deluded heart has led him astray, and he cannot deliver himself or say, is there not a lie in my right? hand. The writer of Isaiah is showing us the folly of idolatry. It's showing us that the, the mockery, we have this great God who has shown himself, has revealed himself to his people and to the world over and over again, has even revealed himself to powerful kings like the Pharaoh in Exodus. He's revealed himself, but yet God's own people are turning to idols that they themselves have made and used and are praying to it and are bowing down to it, expecting those things that they made from their own hands to save them and deliver them. And he's showing the complete ridiculousness of people falling into idolatry when you have the living God in our midst, in our presence, available to help us get through the fiery trials of life. And so these scriptures are in these three friends' mind. They understand what Isaiah means when he talks about the, the, futi- the futility of believing in these idols who we made. Like it doesn't make any sense. I made this and now I'm bowing down to it. It means nothing. 
It can do nothing for me. And this is what Paul speaks about in Romans 1, 21 through 22, where it says that the people looked all around, that God's creation and power is on display in the world, but instead of worshiping the creator, what do they do? We make images in the likeness of beasts and man, and we worship creation rather than the creator. And this is what is the story of mankind altogether. We are so quick to trade the almighty for useless, worthless things. And even our own life, the struggle even as Christians is to take God off his throne and trade him for useless, worthless things in life. Worthless pursuits that take the place of God and we think they're gonna give us life, they're gonna make us happy, they're gonna satisfy us, and they always end up doing the opposite. And so this is the struggle of mankind, and this is what is happening with King Nebuchadnezzar. So at verse 7, at this point, the music plays, the decree has gone out, and this sets the scene, it sets the tension for it. It plays, the music's on, will God's people show obedience, or will they show disobedience to their God? Look at verses 8 through 12 of Daniel chapter 3. It says, therefore... At that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. They declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shabrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. We see the wise men. It's not just King Nebuchadnezzar who is full of pride. It's also his wise men, his magicians, and his enchanters that are also full of pride. Here, they're Babylonians, They're the native people of King Nebuchadnezzar, but yet these Jews, these exiles, are in positions of power that they don't have. So their whole plan, and the author tells us it was a malicious plan, was to bring those three Jewish exiles down and to get them in trouble, to get them out of the way so that they could rise in the ranks of King Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom. And so King Nebuchadnezzar is not just pride. His pride has gone down from him down to the people within his kingdom, and they're trying to undo what God has done. And they tell King Nebuchadnezzar, they appeal to his pride, they're like, look king, you made a decree. The most powerful king in the world said, if you don't worship when the music plays, you're going in the furnace, and these Jews are slapping you in the face because they're not bowing down to your idol. They're refusing to worship. They're not listening. They're not paying attention to you. And the author wants us to see that King Nebuchadnezzar, this whole chapter is, he is trying to get everybody to be loyal to him and him alone. And all of a sudden, he's pointed out that there are people who are not loyal to him, and how dare they not show loyalty to the most powerful king in the universe? How dare they not listen to the most powerful king? I am the one that can choose to spare their life. And during this story, there's no mention of Daniel in all of this chapter. And so a lot of times you think about, where is Daniel? I'm not exactly sure. The chapter before said that Daniel remains at the king's court at the end of chapter 2. So it could be he's off somewhere in the kingdom, in the palace, and he's not present at this time. We're not really sure, but the point of where Daniel is doesn't make or break the story at all. Okay, So we get to a showdown with King Nebuchadnezzar, his loyalty he feels, has been betrayed. He feels that these people, these rulers that he's invested in, these three Jewish men, that they are not bowing down to him. His pride has been hurt. And so he calls them before him. And look at verse 13 through 15. And we come to this ultimate climax where he makes this declaration that is insane. Verse 13. 13. Then Nebuchadnezzar in furious rage commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, 
lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music to fall down and worship the image that I have made well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Ultimate, ultimate challenge of man versus God. King Nebuchadnezzar brings these guys before him, the faithful people of God, and says, I have the ability to save your life or to take your life. When I play the music, you are to worship this statue. If you don't, you die. It makes it a declaration, and who, what God, can deliver you out of my hands. This is the crux of it all for King Nebuchadnezzar. Not only does he think he's the most powerful human on the planet, but he also thinks that he is the most powerful God on the planet. Because no God has the power to save Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He is all powerful, he is omnipotent, he is the king of the universe in his own mind, what could stop him? But what Nebuchadnezzar doesn't know, and many times what we don't know in our life when we have moments of pride, is that God has the ultimate perspective. God has ultimate control and sovereignty in our life. And when King Nebuchadnezzar makes a bold declaration of and what God can save you out of my hand, Psalm chapter two is the answer. Turn to Psalm chapter two. Here's what stands behind King Nebuchadnezzar's boasting. Why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. You see the setting here? Kingdoms of man always set themselves up against the kingdom of God. But here is the perspective of God from heaven sitting on his throne who created these little humans that are trying to run the universe and are trying to shake their fist in the face of God. This is what God thinks. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury saying, as for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree the Lord said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. This is, an image, this is a prophecy and an allusion to Jesus, the son of man who would come, who would establish his kingdom he would crush the kingdoms of this world. He would defeat the kingdoms of this world and the rulers of this world. And it says in verse 10, Now therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be anguish, angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. So King Nebuchadnezzar makes this huge declaration. But God in heaven laughs because he knows that King Nebuchadnezzar is misguided and knows that in a moment he could speak a word and he would snatch the kingdom away from King Nebuchadnezzar. But King Nebuchadnezzar is trying his best to promote himself, to promote his pride, but God in Psalm chapter two shows his ultimate display of power over the power of humanity. You get to verse 16 through 18, the friends are just confronted with an ultimatum. Either bow your knee to my statue and my gods, or you die. How do they respond to King Nebuchadnezzar? It says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, 
and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. What do the faithful people of God do? They hold fast to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They do not waver in their conviction. They do not cower. They do not lose courage. They are brave. Now, I had a discussion earlier today, and where did this bravery come from? Where did this courage come to stand in the face of the king? Because I think sometimes we think, man, if we were in that place as believers in Jesus Christ, that we would, are we, we going to waver? Are we going to bow the knee? Are we going to compromise when we're faced with persecution? And those questions and those fears are real to us because we're humans, and it's fear. We're faced with persecution. Even Jesus' disciples were asking Jesus those very same questions, but what does Jesus tell them? He comforts his disciples and tells them, do not worry what you will say when you're being persecuted. Why is that? Because the Holy Spirit will tell you what to say. Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow because today has enough worry of its own. And where these faithful men of God got the courage from, it was from God's Spirit empowering them reminding them of his goodness, reminding them of his faithfulness, reminding him that even if you die, I am still good, I am your father, and you're not going, you're, if you die, you're going to be with me. And the same is true for us in the face of persecution. Sometimes we think back, I don't know what I would say. We don't have to know right now what we're gonna say. When it happens, God's spirit will tell us how to respond and tell us what to say. And the very first words they tell King Nebuchadnezzar is, we don't need to give you an answer. Now, if you're King Nebuchadnezzar and you just ask them a question and they respond to you, we don't need to give you an answer. You're already furious. That's another fuel added to the fire, okay? And they go on and they tell them, look, here's the thing, King Nebuchadnezzar, our God, you know what? He could deliver us if he chooses to. But if not, we are still not going to worship your gods, and we're not going to commit idolatry. We're not compromising our faith. And here's the truth that we have to get from Daniel, is God doesn't save every faithful person of God when it comes to persecution. Sometimes he does. Other times, the faithful people of God become martyrs. Why? It's up to God's choosing, and it's up to God's will. And we just have to trust that at times, God will deliver. But at other times, God doesn't deliver, but God is still powerful, God is still good, and his plan is still moving forward. You see, Daniel and his friends were okay with the times of life when they mentioned, but if not. And those moments of God where, but if God doesn't, they're still okay. And the same thing in our life, what we can get out of this is, what, are we okay with the moments in our life when it's, but if not? And how do we handle those, but if not moments? And Daniel, Daniel's friends revealed to us how we handle those, but if nots, is to continue to keep trusting. Hold on to God's word. Hold on to God, even when life doesn't make sense. I've gone through periods of my life where God has still, I'm in the waiting room with things, and it's still, but if not, God hasn't. Do I give up on God? Do I give up on faith? Never that. I keep trusting, keep praying, keep waiting, and even if God doesn't, I stay true to him. And this is what his friends reveal to us in this chapter, is God can, yes, we believe it, but if he doesn't, We're not compromising our faith. We're not bowing down to your crazy idol and your fake gods. So King Nebuchadnezzar, here's all of this. Here's their answer. And what happens to him? Verse 19, it says, Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury, and the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated, which probably turn the fire up to match his temper, right? This is what is happening. Fine, you're not going to do it? 
make it go higher. And he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and their other garments, and they were thrown into the burning, fiery furnace. Now picture this. They are clothed from head to toe. All the things that would instantly flame up, okay? Head to toe, all of it. They're thrown into the fiery furnace. They're bound. Because the king's order was urgent and the furnace overheated, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, which brings up a very important point. If we allow pride to get into our life, we are not the only one that pride affects. That people were killed because of King Nebuchadnezzar's pride. The men who demonstrated loyalty to him were killed because of his anger. And so our pride can affect those even closest to us and who love us the most. That pride within our life, undeterred, can affect those that are around us. And these men died because of King Nebuchadnezzar's nasty temperament and because of his pride. Then you get to verse 23. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning, fiery furnace. And what scholars tend to think is that this kind of a furnace, like I always used to think like the furnace was something you just walked up to, threw it in like a fireplace. But what they said, it, what it was, is they would put them on, there was a hole that they would drop through, and then there would be a window that they could see into the furnace. And so they think that this kind of furnace is what his three friends were thrown into, is they were bound, pushed into a hole, and then they could see through a window what was happening inside this fiery furnace. And so it's heated up seven times. His people have died because of it. And what's going to happen? Does God save? Does God allow them to burn? Keep reading. Verse 24. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said to the, to the king, True, O king. He answered and said, but I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire and they are not hurt and the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Three men go into the furnace. King Nebuchadnezzar sees four and they're no longer bound. They're not burning. They're not hurt. They are alive and he sees this and he's like, what is going on? Didn't we throw three? Why are there four people in here? And this fourth one, he looks like a son of of the gods. Now, you guys are smart. Who do you think the fourth one was? Jesus, okay? Some will say, is this God himself? Is it Jesus? It's most likely a reference to Jesus. Yep, we can't confirm 100%, but we know that Jesus is present with his people, and the Son of Gods is referred to, the Son of Man is referred to as Jesus in the New Testament, and I put a quote in your handout that I gave to you from N.T. Wright, and he says this about this part of the chapter. He says, There is one like a son of the gods who has not only made his home with mortals, but he has actually come to them at their point of their suffering. And so remember when, a couple chapters ago, when, the, when they declared, like the magicians declared and said, well, the gods are distant, the gods don't dwell with flesh. Remember when they made that declaration? This is the opposite of this. And I love the way that N.T. Wright puts it because it's showing that the son of man is not a God that's distant. It's a God that's present, and he's so present that he joins you in the midst of your suffering, in the midst of your struggle, whatever it is. This God is present with you. And we see about Jesus in the New Testament that he became like us, that he was tempted in all ways so he would understand what we go through in life. He became like us, became one of us. He is so present with us he took on our form so that he could have a relationship with us that he could purchase us from sin and slavery and give us the forgiveness of sins and restore us and so this god this son of the gods is present in our fiery trials it's a god who loves you it's a god who cares about his people and this goes back to the promise i will never leave you nor forsake you and this is part of the blessing of God being in our lives and being faithful to God is, man, he will be with us in the trial if he delivers. And even if he doesn't deliver, he is in the midst of our pain. And the author wants us to see at the end of it all that God is the deliverer. The God of Israel is the true king. The God of Israel is the only all-powerful being in the universe. And so these friends are saved 
by God and look at King Nebuchadnezzar's confession. When he sees the people not burned up, when he sees them alive, it says this in verse 26. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree, any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb and their houses laid in ruins, for there is no other god who is able to rescue in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. King Nebuchadnezzar witnesses a miracle. The Most High God proves himself. And the miracle is the people were not burned. They weren't touched. It says The author even includes they didn't even smell like the flame. And that's intentional because you only had to be around a campfire for, I don't know, a minute, two minutes, and you smell like a campfire for the rest of the day. And they're proving that even though they were thrown into this furnace, God's miracle, God's deliverance protected them from everything within there. So King Nebuchadnezzar would know beyond a shadow of a doubt, the only being in the world that could have done this is the true living God. And he makes this declaration, but unfortunately, he makes the declaration of the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It is not the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and myself. It is their God. He's delivered. He showed himself at this time to be true. And because they're delivered, he sets them up to be rulers within the province. And then where he once said, what God can save you out of my hand, he then makes a declaration where if anybody says anything about their God, I'm going to put you to death. And we see a reversal here in Daniel chapter 3 where King Nebuchadnezzar realizes the foolishness of his pride and realizes he's not in charge. There is this living God out there, the God of Israel, that he has wrestled with and he has lost. He still doesn't get it yet. He still hasn't fully grasped it, but he realized this God is not one to be reckoned with. And he says, for there is no other God who rescues in this way. And the writer of Daniel is very quick to point this out. And this is a reference back to Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 29. So turn there if you have it. And again, we're going back because the author wants us to understand these stories and wants us to know what these stories are so we can make sense of it here. And all the way back in Deuteronomy chapter 32, this is in the Song of Moses after the people are told, who are you going to choose, the, the mountain of blessing or the mountain of cursing? And then Moses has this whole declaration about God. And in verse 29, it says, if they were wise, uh, they would understand this. Oops, I'm in the wrong chapter. I'm in the wrong verse. Hold on, give me a second. 29. If they were wise, they would understand this. They would discern their latter end. Nope, that's the wrong verse. Because... Uh, give me a second. I might have to come back to that and update you guys on that a little bit later. Because, Or maybe it's verse 9. Maybe that's what it is. Nope. I apologize, guys. I have the wrong one here. If anybody finds it, did you I did. I was going to mention about him being, okay, sorry, 39. Whew, okay, there we go, 39. See now that I, even I, am he, and there is no God besides me. I kill, and I make alive. I wound, and I heal, and there is none that can deliver out of my hand. And here is the complete contrast. King Nebuchadnezzar makes that declaration but God, back in Deuteronomy, said, no, it is I who make alive, it is I who kill, it is I, and no one can deliver out of my hand. And King Nebuchadnezzar learns that powerful truth in here. In Acts chapter 4, verse 12, we flash forward to what we see in Jesus and what Jesus has done for us. In Acts chapter 4, verse 12, it says, And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men 
by which we must be saved. And so again, we see salvation today is only found in Jesus Christ. It's only found in God alone. We can't find it anywhere else and in anyone else. It is only through Jesus Christ that we can meet and know the living, true God. No one else can do it. This story in Daniel chapter 3 becomes a story that provides hope and inspiration to the faithful people of God that constantly found themselves under persecution. The story of Israel, the, the Israelites would come back to the story of Daniel and say, hey, in Daniel and his friends, if we remain faithful, God can deliver, but if not, we're still going to trust him, and we're not going to turn and compromise. And they were willing to give up their bodies. And this is what Paul talks about in Romans 12, where it says, offer your body as a living sacrifice. That they were willing to offer up their own bodies to death in order to remain true and faithful to God. And this is what the story of Israel would find comfort in. The people of Daniel's friends and King Nebuchadnezzar and the people within the kingdom could see there is a different God. He has shown his power. All these other kingdoms of man, they can puff their chest, they can pound on their chest, they can show you, look at all my might, look at all my display, but it all means nothing because there's only one true living God and the faithful people of God don't have to give in to the ways of man. Remain faithful to God no matter what. And we get into Jan Daniel chapter 4. And this chapter is a chapter that parallels with Pharaoh and Joseph. If you go back, you can jot down these references. If you go back to Genesis 37 through 42, you can go through and see the story again of Joseph and Pharaoh. And so you have Joseph and Pharaoh. They're being paralleled with Daniel and King Nebuchadnezzar. Pharaoh was given two dreams. And how many dreams did Nebuchadnezzar have? He had two dreams. Both dreams highlight the kingdom of God versus the kingdom of man. Pharaoh's kingdom against God. King Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom against God. Both Pharaoh and King Nebuchadnezzar, in their dreams, they experience a period of blessing in God's providence, in God's abundance, and they're able to enjoy things in life. But then that period of blessing and abundance, both of them, is followed by a warning and a judgment. And both of them go through a seven-year period of drought. And so the writer of Daniel wants us to remember these stories of Pharaoh and Joseph so we have an idea of what's going to happen here with King Nebuchadnezzar and with Daniel. And then at the end of their stories, both Pharaoh and King Nebuchadnezzar are going to admit the greatness of God and that he is truly the God of heaven and the king of the universe. And you can see that from Genesis 41, 32 through 39, where Pharaoh admits God is God and he is not. So let's look at chapter four, because immediately we have right here, where Nebuchadnezzar is like, woo, we're going to celebrate the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and he's a God, don't say anything against him, and everything's going to go okay. We get right here to verses 1 through 3, and we see King Nebuchadnezzar, to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. It has seemed good to me to show the signs and wonders that the Most High God has done for me. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion endures from generation to generation. This beginning piece of chapter 4 ties in with the very last verse of chapter 4, verse 37, where they both are a praise and confession about the greatness of the Most High God. And so what scholars seem to think is that verses 1 through 3 is a preview or it's a conclusion of everything that follows up to verse 37 where he's proclaiming this is how great this God is because of everything that happens within verses 4 through 37. Does that make sense? So you have a beginning bracket of God is great, his kingdom endures forever. Verse 37, you're going to see the same thing, but he's declaring verse 1 and 3 because of all the stuff that takes place in verses 4 through the end of the chapter. And so he makes this proclamation to everybody. He wants everybody to know God is king. His kingdom is eternal. He's all powerful. Everyone should know that. And then we're going to see in verses 4 through 18 that King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. And this dream is going to set everything in motion. So look at verse 4. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my house and prospering 